Uh, greetings, I'm Karen Engel, and I teach at the University of Texas Law School. And along with Neville Hode, co-direct the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice, as well as the Sissy Farenthold Fund for Peace and Social Justice. And I'm delighted to be here today with Gabriela Torres, who will co-moderate with me. Um, Gabriela is a Rappaport Center summer intern who has several years of experience in human rights activism, community organizing, and community health work, including with Planned Parenthood of Greater Texas and Community of Colors United for Racial Justice. And I'm grateful to our whole Rappaport Center team and to Rachel Ray Boucher for their work in making these roundtables happen. Um, and of course, thanks to our fabulous roundtable participants this evening. So this webinar is the second in our two-part inaugural event of the Sissy Farenthold Fund on Strategies for Reproductive Justice in Texas after the end of Roe versus Wade, from the local to the global. And many of you were with us last Monday for an engaging and provocative discussion on blue zones, red state, strategies for ensuring abortion access in Texas. We discussed with lawmakers representing Austin residents, the promises and pitfalls of a number of legal and policy opportunities and threats at the city, state and federal levels with an eye toward which might have preemptive power. And while there's still much to discuss on last week's topic, um, including Texas's newest lawsuit um, to block the HHS, the state's commitment to making it impossible to allow abortions in Texas also gives us reason to move to part two of our event today, going out of state strategies for ensuring abortion access for Texas residents. And as we head into the discussions, I want to repeat something I said last week, which is that Sissy Farenthold was well aware as early as 1977 that Roe versus Wade would not mean universal or equal access to abortion. As a result of rulings and policies in all three branches of the government that restricted federal funding for abortion. And she was enraged by that. In her speech to the National Women's Political Caucus, she quoted Justice Blackman's dissent in Beale versus Doe, which I think also is good to be reminded of. He said, Quote, the court conceives the existence of a constitutional right, but denies the realization of that right. For the individual woman concerned, the result is punitive and tragic. Implicit in the court's holdings is the condescension that she may go elsewhere for her abortion. Now it was a condescension then because the court was well aware that poor women, particularly many of color, would have no access to abortion if public facilities close their doors to them. Even fewer abortion seekers will have access today if they have no resources to go out of state. And of course, many anti-abortion legislators are trying to make it so that no one, no one can leave the state for abortions. I think that's a fitting segue into our round table. So Gabriela and I will now say a quick word about each of the participants in the order they will speak. And we'll also put their bios in the chat so that we can keep the introductions brief. So let's start with Marsha Jones, who is the co-founder and executive director of the AFIA Center. Now I just said it incorrectly, <laughs> the AFIA Center, a reproductive AFIA, AFIA Center, a reproductive justice organization in North Texas, founded and directed by Black women. She's an expert in reproductive justice, health disparities affecting Black women and girls, HIV, AIDS advocacy, and the relationship between politics and the American healthcare system. Thanks for being with us, Marcia. We're also joined today by Jennifer Ackland, who is a partner with the law firm of Thompson Coburn LLP in Dallas. She's a trial lawyer who focuses her practice on healthcare, white collar fraud, and commercial litigation. She represents a number of abortion funds and providers in Texas, and we're also so grateful for you, Jennifer. Thank you for being here. District Attorney Jose Garza, um, who is our Travis County District Attorney, we're glad you can make it. Um, prior to serving as district attorney, 
Um, he had a wide range of legal experience, particularly in criminal law, immigrant rights, and labor law and advocacy. Um, he was unable to be with us last week, but we very much appreciate that you joined with us this week. And I think it'll be, you'll actually make for a great um, connection between the two, the two discussions. Joining us today as well is Rebecca Ramos Duarte, who's a feminist attorney and executive director of HIDE, which stands for Information Group on Reproductive Choice in Mexico City, um, where she has worked since 2012. And you can read more about her fun bio linked in the chat about her likes and her dislikes. Um, but as will become very clear, um, today, she has played important roles in the struggle for reproductive justice in Mexico as a lawyer, a commentator, and also an organizer. So thank you, Rebecca, for joining us from, from Mexico. And don't miss these chats, especially Rebecca's bio. Um, so finally, Rachel Ray Boucher is back with us this week. Um, and as I mentioned, has been very involved in organizing the panels. She's a leading reproductive health and family law scholar and interim dean and uh, professor of law. So she's not an interim professor, professor of law and interim dean at Temple University. Um, you had the pleasure of hearing her if you were with us last week and receiving links to her co-authored article, but we'll put it in the chat again, the new abortion battleground, um, as well as a number of op-ed pieces, including one on state shield laws, which we'll drop in now as well, um, since it's relevant to our discussion today. So as we begin the round table, let me ask you to post questions in the Q&A. And if you're watching on YouTube, please post your questions there and one of our students will communicate them uh, to the participants. So Gabriela, do you wanna start us off with the first question? Absolutely. And we'll begin with Marsha. So the Afaya Center has been at the forefront of ensuring sexual and reproductive justice in a number of ways for folks, for black women and girls in North Texas for over a decade now. And you have, uh, and you have approached abortion and other reproductive health restrictions as quote, part of an intertwined systems of, part of the intertwined systems of oppression that deny black, indigenous and other people of color access to their rights and are rooted in anti-black racism, white supremacy and other forms of discrimination. And so undoubtedly you have obviously faced many, many obstacles along the way. So much so that with regard to abortion access, you recently stated that you were quote, almost relieved by the overturning of Roe v. Wade, because you now know how to, quote, continue to fight. So could you talk to us a little bit about how the center has navigated these systems thus far and what the fight looks like for you now? Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, so I just wanted to go back a minute for, as it relates to my statement of being relieved. Uh, I, I don't like being held in limbo. Uh, I feel like when when folk because like it gives a certain level of control that you really don't have. And so you're just holding me there. And so I like to have control of how I'm going to move through. And so that was my sense of relief. Um, but just like anybody else, I was totally pissed. I was very I was very upset because I, I truly understand what the impact that this have for the um for the for the folks the women and the uh folk with wombs that we uh serve at the Afia center and so i should always like to make sure that people are really clear about what i meant by that uh because i'm 100 believe that folk ha should always have the option to choose the route that's best for them but uh we the way we've done this work at the Afia center uh we've done the work very unapologetic uh and unapologetically black because we are very clear about the fact that no matter uh, what happens inside of this society in the United States that Black women are usually the least thought of, no matter how far we climb uh, as we matriculate through levels of education, uh, we don't ever get to stop being Black. And the world literally see Black women through the lens of Black. And the United States, you, it literally treat the world teach the world how to treat black women. So because we do this unapologetically, we have to start with race. I know people get tired of hearing about race. They don't wanna hear about race, but we have to start with race. We have to start with gender. We have to start with inequities 
aside from inequalities, because if there's not equity, there will never really be quality, equality anyway. And so we approach the issues using a social justice and a human rights lens. And so we talk about systems of oppression that impact how our lives are led. And so we call it that. We're very in your face. Uh, I'm, I'm an activist. Uh, that's, that's my background. Um, I, I always tell people I'm the executive director because we didn't have anybody else to be it. I would love to have remained uh, an activist. Well, not at 60. I think I'd be tired of being on the streets. But <laughs> I would love to have, because that's what I love to do. And so we, we make the connection. So we started the work live, uh, working with folk living with HIV, and we're going to end the work that way. But we started the work talking about how it is not so much that Black women uh, are living their lives in such a way that they're having sex any different than anybody else. They're making bad choices. No, what they're doing is they're making decisions based on the circumstances that they live. And so if you address the circumstances that people live, the behavior automatically changes. And so if we deal with inequities, if we deal with poverty, if we deal with racism, if we deal with gender, if we deal with, if we deal with political um, inequities, if we deal with these things in a political enfranchisement, if we deal with this, it'll automatically change that, it, you know? And so that is the same approach that we have when we talk about abortion, when we talk about access to the full spectrum of reproductive health care, which includes abortion. So you cannot, own, so we, we talk about the fact that on the one hand, you're living in a state like Texas that refuses to um, expand Medicaid. The data says if you do Medicaid, for one year, um, it will it will decrease maternal mortality rates, right? For these women who are suffering from maternal mortality rates at such a high rate, but they feel like they accomplished something by giving them six months. That's just like being drowning in 12 feet of water, but you have a six foot rope in your hand. You are still going to drown if you can't swim. And so that is the same way that a six month uh, Medicaid, in which they literally only extended it four months, right? Because they already had two. And so now you're saying, we're going to force you to have a child in a state that won't expand Medicaid, period, that won't expand Medicaid to mothers who are more likely to die. But we're going to force you to have a child because we don't really care. And you're going to have it and you're on your own. And so that is the way we do this work. We we call it exactly what it is. We, it is gender bias. It is race bias. It is all of those things. And we don't care. Data says that every time you force black and brown folk to have children, unintended pregnancies, you increase generational poverty. That is the goal to, to continue to create generational poverty so that a certain particular people get to stay in control while certain people don't. So we call it what it is. We don't, we do not go around it. I, I, I don't, uh, I have no problem with BIPOC. I have no problem with people of color. But what I am absolutely clear about is that if we are not talking about black people, very specifically, black people will continue to be left out of the conversation. Um, so uh, bell hooks talk about black women and we use, we use people like bell hook she said there's not ever been, and I'm not exactly quoting her, but she talked about the fact that Black women are the most, uh, most people in, in America to be de-socialized. And, and she says that when, you, when the world talk about people, they're talking about white people. When they talk about men, they're talking about white men. When they're talking about Black people, they're talking, when they talk about women, they're talking about white women. When they talk about Black people, they're talking about Black men. So when do we talk about Black women? So it is important that we talk about that. And it is also important as my time run out that Black women have always known that we would have, that we have always, since we were brought into this country against our will, that we have had to, from that day, fight for bodily autonomy. We have had to make the best choices. We have had to make choices whether or not we would have children or not have children. This is not new. And we had to fight to make the choices on how having those children would look and how parenting would look. I tell people all the time, don't think all slave women produced and had children because they didn't. We came to this country knowing how to take care of that. And we will be in this country forever knowing how to take care of that. And so we can't stop fighting for our reproductive choices and our reproductive rights. And we use the resources out there, legal resources and academia and all of these people to push home 
what it is that we know. And so we take these anecdotal stories. I, 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 I'm an anecdotal person. I, I live by stories. That's a part of reproductive justice anyway, using our lived experiences to talk about our life and our experiences in this country. And so using the experiences of the women that we talk to, those lived experiences to convey the seriousness of what we are dealing with at this time, because we are forcing people to be poor. We're forcing people to die. And we are also over-criminalizing people um, who are already over-criminalized by the system. Thank you. Um, I, I have a, a follow-up question on, on sort of where your thinking is around the going out of state. Um, I mean, everything you just said, fighting anti-Black racism, fighting the structural causes is work that needs absolutely has to continue inside the state. Um, that's not something that can be moved out. Um, but to the extent that you provide services or support services um, for people who might not be in, in able um, due to legal restrictions um, to have those services here, I wonder to what extent, could you tell us maybe about what your best hope is for out-of-state options for people you serve? So my best hope for out-of-state people that, so my best hope for people who live in Texas that's got to have this is that, that the legal system will do what it is supposed to do and open up the door so that we can provide people with a full spectrum of reproductive health care. Um, what we will absolutely not do at the Afia Center is break the law. We are not going to break the law. We are already a group of black women who are overly criminalized anyway. And so we're not going to exacerbate that. What we will do, if folk are forced to carry full term, we have uh, four full spectrum doulas at the Athea Center who can make sure that if folk are forced to carry full term, that they can have not the birth of their choice because they didn't want a birth, but that they can have the best choice in such a bad situation. But we will continue to work with other advocates outside of the state. We will continue to work to provide people all of the legal information that we can provide them for how that they can get the resources to have, um, to have to make the choices that they need. And we will also make sure that people are getting the information that they need to, if they're going to uh, have an abortion, that uh, we wanna make sure that you're doing, that you, we're not telling you what to do, but we just wanna make sure that we're able to tell people not to drink bleach you know, not to uh, do things like that. But we won't tell you not to drink bleach, but drink that. That's not our, that's not where we're at right now. We're going to let the legal system take its course. Um, and I believe that and we're going to let the political system take its course. And we're going to continue to encourage people to vote, to vote RJ, use a, re a reproductive justice referendum to vote, be an informed RJ voter and vote for people running for office that understand the importance of reproductive justice and how they, uh, uh, legislate uh, folk lives, but that, that's, that's all we can do right now. Our hands are as tied as any other people in the state of Texas and anywhere else. We are at our wits end um, in this. Yeah, I, so you've kicked it over to the lawyers um, and it just so happens that they're next, although not just the lawyers, the legal system. So that is a big, a big call and the political system. Um, thank you so much for the work that, that you all do. And, um, and, and thanks also for clarifying. I mean, I, the, the comment about the relief and I, the reason why we chose it is very much because I think that limbo, as you say, is so devastating for so many people. And it seems like part of the plan here is to continue to have people in limbo. So you might, unfortunately, even that doesn't necessarily um, maybe leave you with the certainty that you were hoping for. But perhaps Jenny will tell us otherwise. Um, and so uh, I'll take this to, to, to Jennifer Eklund. Um, and as a lawyer representing abortion providers and funds, um, you've also been engaged in a long fight, much of it taking place in the legal system in the context of litigation, and often in response to threats from anti-abortion activists, so much so that you've sued some of them for defamation. Um, and so based on these experiences that date back, and I think it's an important reminder to before even SB8, 
Um, what should we now be braced for? Um, thanks, Karen. I, I mean, unfortunately, as the forever bearer of bad news for the current time, like I think we have to be braced for the worst. In Texas, I mean, it's the testing ground for the most oppressive policies. It was with SBA, it will continue to be, and they haven't slowed down since Dobbs was decided. It wasn't like victory was declared. You know, abortion funds and practical support networks like the AFIA Center and others are primarily staffed and volunteered for by the people who are already over-criminalized. So the threats are really sincere to them and they have to be careful at all times as to what they're subjecting themselves to. What SB8 did was put everyone in the crosshairs of a civil lawsuit, whatever that looked like. But what people don't realize is that once Dobbs took effect, now there's a belt and suspenders approach, right? All abortion is criminalized. And if DAs won't prosecute in progressive areas, then they have SBA ready to go. And we've seen them being prepared to do that from the outset. Um, you know, last week there were what are called 202 petitions seeking discovery from various folks um, involved with Whole Woman's Health and other providers that provided care during the time that the TRO was in place against um, the pre-row statutes, which was a, a brief day or two. And in that day or two that services were provided, they've already been sued, essentially, to get discovery as to all the people who were involved in that so that they can bring SB8 lawsuits if the DAs won't prosecute. Um, in those 202 petitions, they've accused people of murder. I mean, repeated sets of murder is what is what they're focused on, even though they have no authority to prosecute for murder. Um, those those letters are not limited to that one group of people, however, as, as I think people know from the reporting last week, Sidley Austin, a big law firm, um, was hit with one of those letters as well. And just today, I got word that a 202 petition has been filed against the managing partner of that firm as well, seeking all the information about their policies, how many abortions took place, where they were, where whether pills were taken in Texas, what have you. We at my firm have received litigation holds accusing us of being um, accomplices to crime and therefore dissolving our privilege in order to scare our abortion fund clients even further um, in terms of being able to to receive legal um, advice. And as Marcia just said, you know, for all of our clients, they're trying to fulfill their reproductive missions without breaking the law. That's always been what they were trying to do. But now the landscape is so vastly different that it's almost impossible to know from which angle they're coming at next. So the other thing to bear in mind there is that SB8 created a problem for anyone who wanted to proactively challenge laws against abortion regulations in Texas, such that if you proactively challenge the laws, then you as the challenger and your lawyers are jointly and severally liable for the other side's attorney's fees, unless you win every single claim. So basically they've created a huge financial disincentive for all these folks. They've also created a reality under SBA where they could be threatened with bankruptcy. And these are folks who do all kinds of work in all kinds of ways, but it has limited their ability to provide care to Texans in need because the, the challenges keep on coming so fast. Um, Anti-abortion activists have deputized themselves as the investigators and the enforcers of these laws. It's not coming from, you know, <laughs> district attorneys and it's not coming from from anyone other than activists themselves. And that's the world that they've created in Texas. Um, but in Texas and beyond, I think what we can expect to see going forward is more of the same. They're obviously moving towards a, a push towards fetal personhood, which would change um, and deprive those who, are carry, who carry children of their rights even further. They're talking about using kidnapping statutes to deal with cross-border abortions for folks who leave the state. They have legislation ready to go to disbar attorneys who support pro-choice policies or laws or defend clients who may be in the crosshairs of these activists. The big focus from a number of the groups is to outlaw what they refer to as abortion terror, uh, tourism, which essentially puts interstate travel on the block already. And I think y'all probably saw that last week there was a House vote on a right to travel bill that almost every single Republican voted against. Um, it's, it's scary. They have in Texas legislation getting ready to go that's gonna authorize supposedly, <laughs> if they can defend it constitutionally, DAs to enforce abortion laws in other DAs jurisdictions. 
Um, and they want to use the SB8 style civil enforcement mechanism for other kinds of oppressive policies as well. Also on the list is, of course, emergency contraception and IUDs, and they are just pushing forward with all of it. Um, they don't care whether it's legal is the big takeaway I think people don't recognize. The practicalities for our clients and the funds and anybody who works in this space or helps people to obtain care, they don't care whether, whether what they're doing is constitutional or whether it's legal. Their goal is to, to intimidate and harass so that the funds and the practical support networks are afraid and they're starved of the resources that they need to function at all. Because by the time a court says it's unconstitutional what they've done, their hope is that those organizations will be gone. So that's what we're dealing with in the interim. In this period of time while we wait for the, the legal system to work, we have to find a way to make these challenges in such a way that doesn't subject our clients to even more risk. And they have to be able to protect their volunteers, their staff, um, from these very real threats that could be criminal, depending on where and how they they make the call. But as you've seen, they've already taken the position, um, anti-abortion activists, that um, you know if the pills are taken at any time in the state of Texas, that medication abortions are subject to criminal penalties and um, SB8 challenges as well. And finally, I'll just leave you with this. Last week, the sponsor of the Sanctuary City for the Unborn Ordinances did an interview with the Austin American Statesman that they posted. And he went beyond their supposedly staunch position in support of mothers and those who bear children who they never claimed to target before and said that now is the time to consider that a pregnant person who aborts should probably bear criminal responsibility as well. So that's next on the list too. I mean, Texas will continue to be their testing ground until there is a groundswell against it. And I think we're starting to see some of that, but the threats to folks who do this work right now are very, very real. Well, that's just a really um, difficult and I would say bleak reality that you've illustrated and you painted for us. Um, you know, along those lines of uh, folks having to protect themselves and their employees and their their workers, um, their community, you know, whole women's health is, as you know very well, it is moving its clinics to New Mexico. And so to what extent do you think that whole women's health will continue to be able to serve Texans, if at all? And, and you know, will funds be able to, to help ensure that the folks, Marsha Jones, for example, and other organizations work with are able to use these kinds of services? Um, I do think there will be a, a legal path forward for folks in Texas who do the work and want to help people get out of state. Right now, the big concern is making sure that no part of the abortion takes place in Texas so that they're beyond the reach of these other folks for the time being. Um, I think the other important thing to know is that there are organizations outside of Texas that maybe these activists don't have the same reach jurisdictionally to get to. So there may have to be solutions in the interim that help that involve non-Texans helping Texans and maybe the other way around. Um, the time for creative problem solving is upon us in the most dire circumstances. But um, the hope is that through the legal pathway of determining what jurisdictionally is and is not possible for the activists on the other side to do, we can stitch together a continuum of care that will help people in Texas and in other hostile states. Well, thank you, Jenny, for sharing that very vital and important information and for all the work that you do. And so we're going to go over to you, actually, Jose. Um, you know, almost immediately after the Dobbs decision was handed down, you made a public statement that regardless of what Texas legislature or Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton does in terms of declaring abortion illegal, that your office would not prosecute folks who seek abortions or those who provide it. And so you later signed onto a letter, which we'll include in the chat here, um, with prosecutors from around the country saying, quote, we decline to use our office's resources to criminalize reproductive health decisions and commit to exercise our well-settled discretion and refrain from prosecuting those who seek, provide, or support abortions. And so could you tell us 
more about that discretionary power and the extent to which you can encourage providers, funders, and abortion seekers to rely upon it. Absolutely. First of all, it's um, it's a pleasure and honor to be with this incredible, um, amazing panel of women doing amazing work right here in our state and across the country. Um, and I'm humbled to be an ally in this fight with all of you. I think it's important for us to start with the why, um, why that's the right decision for our community. We don't have to look too far back um, to understand what life was like before Roe in the United States. We know that before Roe, um, upwards of a thousand women a year died um, seeking unsafe abortions. We know that across the planet um, currently, that somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 20,000 women a year die because of unsafe abortions. The reason that um, I and so many other prosecutors across the state and across the country have taken this position is because um, we don't, I don't want women who live in my community suffering or dying at home because they're too scared to go to the doctor. And so um, I would implore any person living in Travis County um, who needs medical attention to seek that attention um, and to do what is in the best interest of their own um, personal health. With respect to the question of our um, of our discretion, the statutory mandate of any prosecutor in the state of Texas is to see that justice is done. The law is clear. Our job is not to seek convictions. Our job is to seek justice. Um, and the rules of ethics that govern our profession and that govern um, this work specifically have been even more clear um, that in every case, part of our job um, is not just to bring charges and seek um, prosecutions and convictions, but to determine what a just outcome is, including not bringing criminal charges at all. That has always been the role of the prosecutor. Um, and for as long as I am the district attorney in Travis County, that will continue to be the role of the prosecutor in our community. And we will continue to ensure that um, no person is prosecuted for making personal health care decisions in our community. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so the, and I see you have a heart floating up as well. Um, so the several, several, I see them out of the corner of my eye. Um, I think you've all gotten hearts um, and thumbs up. So the the focus today is largely on going out of state. Um, and uh, I, so I want to ask you a question that at least is a bit akin to what I've asked some of the other speakers the, thus far, because I think a lot of the the focus has been on travel out of state, but there are a lot of in-state travel, in travel questions as well. Um, so if your strategy uh, were to succeed, District Attorney, um, then you could imagine that people would come from other parts of Texas to provide and seek services here. Um, although Jenny importantly reminded us of the potential civil consequences that would not go away. Um, and as she also noted, some legislators are threatening to prevent that by giving power to anti-abortion prosecutors elsewhere in the state. Um, and some are saying that they can do that even without legislation. So I'm just wondering if you could now talk to us a bit about those threats and any thoughts that you have for how you or others might mitigate or fight them. Well, I think over the last decade, um, if not longer, the Republican leadership in the state of Texas has made clear time and time again that they will play politics with our public safety, that they will take steps that actively harm our communities, that put people in danger if they think that um, that doing so will score political points for them. And so, you know, I think Jenny has, has laid out um, the worst of their intentions. And I think that we should assume that they're gonna make an honest run out of every single one of them. Um, and it is possible that some, if not many of those proposals will, will make their way through 
and become law if our statewide politics do not change in the next four months. Um, the good news is that we have an opportunity to change our statewide politics in the next four months. But I, I do want to, um, I think there are a couple of things that that we should keep in mind. One, um, the state constitution and uh, the Court of Criminal Appeals, which is the highest court in the state of Texas for criminal cases, have both been pretty clear that the only entity with authority to bring state criminal charges um, is your locally elected district attorney's office. Now, um, again, our, our Republican leadership has made clear that they have um, that that the Constitution is um, a, a small obstacle for them, um, and that you know there is nothing that they won't try um, to impose their radical beliefs into our law. But that is the current law in the state of Texas, and we're going to continue to to abide by it. And I would also um, I, I want to just make a couple of other points. Um, you know, to my colleagues who are prosecutors across the state. What I would say to you um, is that power is fleeting. 75% um, of the state's population live in Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and Dallas. Um, one day, uh, and I'm sorry, Austin, um, San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas. One day, and I believe in the very near future, the dynamics of power are going to change in our state. And when they do, um, I hope we will have not set the precedent that prosecutors in one part of our state can bring cases in another. Um, I am pretty confident that prosecutors across the state don't want me and my colleagues in Bear County, Dallas County, um, with control over what cases get brought in their jurisdiction. I also want to make um, just one other brief point. Uh, just to, to emphasize Marsha's point, um, we know what we're heading towards. Um, we know the why, but we also know the who. Um, it will be Black women. It will be Latinas. It will be communities of color. It will be working class communities that are disproportionately harmed and impacted by these draconian laws. And so, um, you know, I think you suggested, uh, Professor, that I have a strategy. And the reality is um, there is no strategy, just a moral imperative. Um, and if there is a strategy that any of us can share, as, as Marcia suggested and others have, um, everybody has to be active and vote in about four months. And that is the best shot we have um, to protect our families and our communities from what's coming. Well, thank you. And um, that's a strategy too, right? <laughs> um, but I didn't mean to overstate the term, but I but I do think, and if we have time in the Q&A, we can talk a little bit more too about what it means to bring together the, the broad um, coalition of prosecutors that you all did. And since so much of this, that would be another angle to the out of state, right? Is that you want to make sure that people are aligned um, in other places as well. So get to turn to Rebecca Ramos Duarte now, who maybe has a like an uplifting story or at least um, something positive that can come out of a lot of struggle. Um, so uh, we already mentioned um, about Hire, which has been at the center of reproductive justice advocacy, broadly defined, um, uh, dealing with many of the same issues actually that Afia the AFIA Center deals with. Um, so Hira has been at the center of that in Mexico for nearly three decades, um, and it has been a long battle, but largely using a human rights lens, you and many others um, work together to succeed in having abortion decriminalized in Mexico. Um, and we were well aware of it in Texas because the Mexican Supreme Court decision came down only a few days after the Texas legislature passed here past SB8, and you all were aware of that as well. So I wonder if you could just start by 
maybe distilling a few lessons from your experiences in Mexico for providers, um, funds, and advocates here as we begin to live in this post row landscape. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen, and thank you for having me. It's it's an honor to to share with you uh, your experiences and what are you dealing right now in in the states and in greeting in Texas with with this new landscape. And and here in Mexico, what I what I want to say first is that we have had a, a very good news uh, in Mexico with the Supreme uh, Court uh, decision, but also say that that we we have to struggle in, in, in a very similar situation as you do now, because we have to to go for every decriminalization in every state of, of Mexico. Uh, with the Supreme Court resolution, it is not the 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 impact that that has the, the Supreme Court seen in the states in terms of uh, automatically open the the health services in and in that case we we are uh, dealing uh, uh, something uh, similar uh, like like you uh, guys in the in the states but of course that having a, a constitutional resolution uh, as we have right now here here in Mexico uh, makes the things different, of course. But what, what I want to, to share in terms of, of our uh, best practices, if you, if you want to, to call it, is in, in two uh, main points. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, what he what he have done uh, for many years is work not only in the national uh, level with the Supreme Court or, or with the National Congress, but working with the states uh, congresses, the states uh, uh, Ministry of Health, in terms of uh, trying to to move uh, some political willings to to give give them a, a legal and constitutional arguments in terms of what abortion shouldn't be in a criminal uh, code in a penal code why uh, it has to be a, a an essential uh, a health uh, service so that part uh, for me and, and for here it has been uh, fundamental in terms of uh, not only work in Mexico City at a national level. And the second uh, point that I want to, to share with you is all the work that we have done uh, in the last years, like uh, five years ago, uh, in terms of the Marea Verde in, with this uh, Latin America social movement that has uh, given us uh, not only a, a symbol as the as the green handkerchief in terms of of saying uh, who, who is uh, wearing a, a, a green handkerchief is saying I want to legal and free abortion but also in terms of going out to to the streets uh, all the the demonstrations that we have had in the in the country and also in Argentina in in Colombia it has been a, a very strong a very strong uh, power to move these political wills that uh, we have the decriminalization in Mexico City in 2007 and then we we think that it, it will be a, like a wave in in Mexico, and it didn't happen. We have in the in the contrary uh, many uh, local amendments in terms of the person personhood of the fetus, and it has to to pass twelve years until 2019 when the second state uh, decided to decriminalize and it was in the framework of, of Marea Verde, of the, of the green tide. So I think that uh, in, in, in a brief, uh, the, the work with the local and state, uh, not only authorities, but also a landmark, uh, uh, low mark uh, makers and also a, a uh, uh, organizations and accompaniantes, the, the women that uh, have uh, done and, and gave the information and the drugs to, to get safe abortions in the local uh, level, and also the social decriminalization, uh, the social movement in not only in, in the streets, but also in terms of cultural uh, events, concerts has been uh, very important for the improvements that, that we have had uh, here in Mexico.
Well, we're very grateful, you know, for Hida's essential work and appreciate what you what you shared about you all's experience in similar contexts. It's just really exciting um, to have you here with us. But, you know, following up a little bit um, with what's going on over here and keeping that connection, you know, almost immediately after Mexico's uh, Supreme Court's decision, um, Texas residents seeking abortions who could travel began to seek care in Mexico, right? And so could you tell us a little bit about who you saw seeking care, if you were able to see that, and you know what impact that might have had or it might have moving forward on on uh, Mexico's ability to provide uh, specifically for folks, uh, Mexican folks who are seeking abortions. Um, how might that be managed moving forward? Well, uh, well, we have uh, we have we are struggling right now in terms of the services, and and also I want to uh, return it. What what I what have said what I uh, said in terms of it's not in all Mexico where where abortion is legal in the first trimester. If we think of the border, there is only two states, uh, Baja California and Coahuila, where are uh, legal to to get an abortion uh, in the in the first trimester when you don't have uh, some indication of rape or, or health uh, risk. So uh, that, that first thing I, I want to, to be very, very clear in, in terms of, of what is legal in the, in the border. And also uh, share with you that, that in terms of the public services, in the cases of, of Baja California and also uh, Coahuila, we're struggling a lot because there is no uh, political will to, to provide the services. It is not the same situation that we have here in Mexico City or that we have, uh, for instance, in Hidalgo, there is a central uh, state in, in Mexico. So right now what, what is happening is uh, that women uh, from the states that there are seeking for abortion, they are uh, contacting to uh, organizations, uh, to colectivas, uh, that they uh, give information and also uh, medication for safe abortions. So that's that's right now the the, the situation and and uh, to be here uh, uh, today with, with you it's very clarifying also to to acknowledge the the risk the legal risk that, that you have in, in in Texas but also that can uh, be uh, applied for the people in Mexico who are uh, helping people uh, to, to get a, a safe abortion with with uh, drugs, with with, uh, uh, with medication. So right now, I think that there is very, very important for us in, in Mexico and, and in the border to, to have this kind of dialogues, to have this kind of conversation with you and to, to understand better what are the legal risks and how can we deal uh, with, with them and, and because of uh, Marsha, just uh, say it. It's the people, it's the women who are over criminalized. And, and in terms of, of help, and, and we want to, to help uh, you and we want to, to help them, uh, we, we have to be very careful in, in what ways we, we are doing with this work because we don't want to, to put them uh, in, a, in a risk situation, uh, taking in account the, the situation that uh, they are living right now. So, so around, right now, uh, in terms of public services in the border, there are not uh, public services provide, uh, provided in by, the, by the government in, in, in Mexico. That was... Um... And you, Rachel Ray Boucher has your answers, um, and fortunately, um, she is next. And you know, also to say, I mean, I, I it, it is important to learn from your experience, not only um, in the decriminalization battle, but also just what you all did see in terms of Texas residents. Um, but of course, just to acknowledge that undocumented pregnant folks in this country are, they can't go north and they can't go south. Um, and they're the ones who are perhaps most caught of anyone. Um, so Rachel Ray Boucher, glad to have you back again. Um, 
And you and your co-authors have written about, and I know you have consulted on a number of state shield laws and executive orders coming from different states in the United States, um, aiming to ensure that providers in abortion supportive states are able to minimize the risk of prosecution for providing abortion services to residents of abortion restrictive states. And since um, Rebecca just mentioned it, I feel like we need to tell people that you've also written quite a bit about the right to abortion in international law and in a number of non-US jurisdictions. So I know you worked on the Connecticut law um, and others maybe as well, but could you tell us what you think a model law in abortion supportive states might include? And if there is some time at least touch upon maybe the difference between uh, the risks in other jurisdictions versus non-US jurisdictions. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And I, I know we don't have a ton of time, so uh, I do, I'm gonna try to talk very, very fast so we can get to any questions from the audience, but I have to spend just a, a second saying thanks to Karen and Gabriella and to the rest of the panel. Um, I'm really happy to be here with, with all of you today. Um, and Karen forgot to mention that I am a native Texan who grew up in Oak Cliff in Dallas. Uh, my parents went to Sunset, so <laughs> I, uh, I spent a lot of time in Dallas. Um, so I, I think that model legislation, you know, I think this is responding exactly to just the type of proposals that uh, Jenny laid out, that the Texas Freedom Caucus really has given uh, the given a country a, a very public blueprint of what states are going to do to try to have their laws have extraterritorial ter effect. And uh, I can't agree more with Jenny. It's not clear at all that those laws are constitutional and that does not matter. <laughs> it does not matter to the strategy of trying to write and enact those laws. Um, the Texas Freedom Caucus in the letter that Jenny mentioned to Sidley Austin being just very plain that they will use the SB8 mechanism to try to pass laws that will be shielded from federal court review. And these aren't new strategies. These are strategies that existed really targeted at minors in the past to try to keep minors from leaving states to seek parental consent or uh, to avoid parental consent laws laws that were struck down, a law that was struck down in Missouri in the early 2000s by the Missouri Supreme Court, and a law that never passed uh, the, uh, before Congress. Um, so what the, the states that you're seeing, like Connecticut and New York, I just, I guess I'll say a couple, of, a couple of things about what those states law include, and where I think states are moving to think about what else those pieces of legislation might offer. So um, as Karen mentioned, Connecticut was first and it's been followed by New York, uh, California, Massachusetts might soon pass its own shield laws complemented by executive orders uh, that are both in those states, outside of those states from governors who are also looking to enact uh, shield policies. And the, the laws do a few things. They try to protect providers that are offering legal services within the state from attack from outside the state. So they, uh, these are, um, there are provisions that uh, refuse to comply uh, with investigations from out of state entities, subpoenas, discovery and the like, uh, refuse to extradite a provider who is not fleeing from justice, uh, no disciplinary action taken by the uh, enacting state's medical license board, uh, no corresponding increase in malpractice insurance because of an action taken out of state uh, for the legal provision of, of abortion. Um, and then uh, Connecticut, for instance, has a countersuit where providers in Connecticut, people assisting them, if sued by someone in another state for a legal abortion provider provided in Connecticut can counter sue for damages. So trying to chill the use of lawsuits to impede the provision of legal abortion elsewhere. Where I think this conversation is heading has also been alluded to and suggested in this, in this, uh, uh, for this panel. 
uh, Massachusetts is considering a shield law, as I mentioned pre uh, currently, uh, that it's likely that the governor will sign. It, it does something really interesting uh, that lots of folks have been talking about, and that is trying to shift where care occurs from the place where the patient is to the place where the provider is. And that would have the effect of applying a state's law where the provider is rather than a patient. So if a patient is receiving a medication abortion in, the, in Texas uh, via telehealth uh, before 10 weeks of pregnancy uh, with online services, the provider is in Massachusetts. Under Massachusetts law, that provider is performing a legal abortion because what matters is the provider's location, not the patient. Now, what's wrong with shield laws? They are not perfect shields. <laughs> they are not. They are not. They are not shields that can't be dented, and uh, and they are not shields without cracks. Because of course, that doesn't stop Texas from enacting its own laws that try to punish providers through their own uh, uh, state mechanisms. Texas courts might not have jurisdiction over those providers or people who assist them, but nonetheless. Um, jurisdiction can be created if you have a stopover through Dallas uh, or through Houston. Uh, so I, I know I'm, I'm running out of time. There's another looming issue here about the full faith and credit clause for, for uh, pieces of legislation that also apply to judgments, but uh, we're, we're in fast moving territory here. Thank you, Rachel. And, and we're, I think we're doing, we're doing good on time. We're scheduled in until 6.15, but thank oh, you. Oh, for... excellent. I thought we were... <laughs> no, thank you for keeping that in mind. We appreciate it. We're, we're doing great on time. I just um, had last uh, the last yeah. panel's uh, timing in my mind to, so, so firmly, but all right, well, then but I'm you... just going to slow down. <laughs> Can I just yeah. ask, since we do have a little bit more time and because there is, so apologies, Gabriela, but um, because there is a question in the chat too, um, about telemedicine being used in Mexico. Um, I mean, that's a, anyway, it seems like it, it's treading on the question you didn't get to, Rachel, too, in terms of um, non-US jurisdictions. Yeah, no, so that's, thank you. Um, so the, the reason to, to think about what, uh, how states define the standard of care and how they're defining um, their telehealth regulations, because uh, for those who can gain access to telehealth services, uh, whether that be through startups or organizations that exist in the United States, through organizations like Aid Access that work with not just US-based providers, but providers based in other countries, pharmacies based in other countries, um, it's worth just taking a moment to remember that not everyone is going to have access to telehealth services because they're not going to have access to the relevant technologies. They're not going to have, there is a deep digital divide in this country based on resources, income, region, race. Um, and many people are not going to be candidates for medication abortion, either because they're beyond uh, 10 weeks of pregnancy or they have pregnancy complications that prohibit them from taking the medications, which also correspond with very deep disparities in the healthcare of our country. That said, if you are a candidate for medication abortion, um, increasingly so, uh, you can receive that through telemedicine after the FDA lifted the requirement that you pick up the medications at a healthcare facility. This dovetails with the aid access approach that, uh, that I described. And I think that SB8 provided an example that once people, uh, once SB8 took effect, people really looked to organizations like aid access, the, the amount of demand went up by 185% for Texas residents seeking to order medication abortions on uh, medication abortion pills online. And so um, the role of these, you know, the role I think of out of country pharmacies becomes increasingly important as does the role of online pharmacies housed in the United States uh, because we will soon have a new process by which pharmacies can dispense medication abortion, a certification process that hasn't been announced yet by the FDA. 
Uh, right now, we have basically one pharmacy providing the bulk of all medication abortion delivery uh, that's not directly mailed to, to patients. And uh, you can expect this landscape to change. Uh, but on the international question, I, I loved uh, what Rebecca had to say because I think for so long, there has been this perception that the United States is its model of permissive abortion law. Um, and that's never been true <laughs> in the sense that we've always had put abortion deserts or their access has been really encumbered, particularly after Casey, especially after Casey. Um, as someone who teaches in the area, the number of students who come to, who, who I teach who are from outside the United States have a perception that you could receive an abortion at a Walgreens. Um, and, but that, that landscape now has flipped. And despite what Justice Alito and Justice, Chief Justice Roberts think, the U.S. now truly is an outlier <laughs> in abortion access because the trend is clearly toward abortion permission across the globe. So um, I'll stop there. So you gave me a little bit of time and I just took it. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, we, we do have a follow-up question uh, for you as well. And I mean, you've touched on this already. And, and just to reiterate and kind of summarize um, what you've said, you know, it's certain that, that, that legislators in some states, including Texas, will try to penalize out-of-state providers. You talked about that. Um, and the people who, who assist uh, folks who are obtaining out-of-state services as well. But how might legislators do that and that and also like how could they be countered? So I think it's in some of the ways that we've discussed that um, uh, uh, the way to target uh, people who are providing abortions out of state is to, I think, target their license uh, to try to uh, using the discretion of uh, of medical licensing boards to penalize them uh, with disciplinary actions that then could have effects for their malpractice insurance. It is to try to target, uh, target them through SB8 style measures that can evade federal court review. Uh, even, even if those measures of some courts would, would hold them unconstitutional under a right to travel, privileges, immunities, interstate commerce protections. Um, and how do we counter them? The work that everyone on this panel is doing, you know, the, the braveness of uh, District Attorney Garza standing up early first, powerfully saying, this is not where our resources and our money is going to go. Um, work that uh, Ginny is doing, uh, uh, protecting funds, making sure that they have representation for, uh, for the care that they're providing to people, to the assistance that they're providing. What Marsha has so powerfully uh, began our conversation by centering what are the, what's the material assistance people need now that the state of Texas has hung them out to dry and just ignored the reality of their social economic lives. How do we provide that and how do we center who they are? How do we center race and how do we center what their, what their needs will be? And Rebecca, um, as this conversation transcends borders, what is our conversation? What is our relationship? How are we going to access this care as we travel to and from the state of Texas as we order pills online? Um, how, can, how, can we, how can we be thinking together about these issues? My gosh, I think, I think you're, you know, totally right, Rachel. And I love how you wove all of the work of this roundtable. Our work definitely intersects and we need each other, right? And, and we purposefully um, made this roundtable in that way. And so thank you so much to, to all of you all for your words and your insight. Um, we are going to take some questions now from our audience. Um, Jenny answered one earlier, and I just want to read through it just because I know that folks um, who are viewing via YouTube might not have access to that. But um, someone anonymously asked, where do the legal challenges to SB8 stand, specifically in terms of the constitutionality of the vigilante enforcing mechanism? Is the Supreme Court going to be deciding on it? 
when Jenny answered, they are at the Austin Court of Appeals currently. From there, appeals would go to the Texas Supreme Court and then possibly to the, um, sorry, to the Texas Supreme Court and then possibly to the Supreme Court of the United States. I should have been a little more specific on that, I'm sorry. Um, we have a few snaps in our Q&A too about how this has been great, so thank you uh, for that. Now there is a question um, for Rebecca, but I, you know, I acknowledge that if anyone else would like to to share, please, please do. And so the question is, uh, Rebecca, is telemedicine used in Mexico for providing medication abortion? And then I think this, you know, others can can chime in on the second part of the question. Do you envision a service from Mexico City to Texan folks in the border so they can pick up their prescription? Thank you. Well, uh, with telemedicine, we we just started uh, a few years ago uh, with with COVID nineteen pandemic. It uh, we, we see the 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 necessity of of go further and and, and have a, a a longer strategy. But the the truth is that that right now we don't have a very clear what the legal. Uh, status is in in Mexico City because uh, we have this federal uh, this federal regulation in terms also uh, of, of abortion and uh, the second part of the of the questions in terms of, of sending uh, abortion pills from Mexico City to to Texas to uh, or to other state in, in the states the thing is that uh, misoprostol here in Mexico is a, a pill that is over the counter you don't need a prescription so so that is for example one of the things that we can uh, share and and, and discuss uh, together uh, looking uh, for for some uh, better uh, ideas to to send uh, the 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 pills but but the truth is that, that right now we we can't uh, send in in that way uh, but but we have uh, with with the uh, services in Mexico City the health services and and in in particular the abortion services uh, we're working in terms of telemedicine and, and that could be that could be a, an answer for the for for the needs uh, in in Mexico uh, in in the country I mean and also uh, we, in Texas for for instance. Great. I on the jurisdiction, we have we have time. We'll have this one last question, but we can turn it into kind of a broader out of state jurisdiction question, or folks can chime in however they like. Um, so it's a question from Olive Hershey, uh, who asks: Is there anyone studying the notion of a floating clinic in international waters staffed by clinicians? And I know this is something Rachel and I talked a little bit about. Um, but does anyone would anyone like to comment? Because there is the there is the floating, there is one that's set to start in California, right, and be in the Gulf. So we've talked about in state, we've talked about out of state, and now we're kind of in between states. I think legally. I do think people have been studying all of the possibilities because we do need creative problem solving that can reach folks. Um, I think legally it is, and Rachel can correct me because she certainly um, studies all of this or has for a lot longer than me, but the reality is it's not so clear what is completely possible and protected and what isn't. And so there's a lot of work I think probably that has to go into um, determining risk and figuring out who would be, um, who might be a target if those types of creative problem solving things went forward. I think, I think we have to put all options on deck. Um, my sense of the, of the law is limited to one case out of Florida, um, reaching folks who are in international waters, but at my, my sense is that the constitutional law around that is not as clear as we would like for it to be. It's a little like the federal enclaves argument in that same sense. And so 
beyond the complexities of really where does federal law apply exclusively and when is state law incorporated, there are the logistical problems of the second you step foot back on state soil, <laughs> that that state can enact all kinds of policies that have targeted your behavior. And again, I, I, the reason I mentioned medical licenses is because there's really so much power over someone's license. And SB8 was a powerful example that um, many folks were not necessarily chiefly concerned, though it was a very real and it's a very important concern about being sued by a, an individual. They were worried about losing their licenses and not being able to practice any medicine uh, uh, across the board. Thank you. So, um... We are at 6.14, but I want to see if any of the panelists want to chime in on anything here at the end. Uh, Including, the I, only thing that I would, Oh, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. The only thing that I would say is that the, I, I put it in the chat on the um, Zoom, but the, the one glimmer of hope is that Marsha and others like her and other funds and practical support networks took on in state court SB8 civil enforcement mechanism a year ago. And so that is already well underway. And they have a really good decision that the civil enforcement mechanism is unconstitutional. That's just working its way up through the courts. But the fact that it started a year ago is important because the appeals take time. And so the fact that we're a year ahead gives us a little bit of a glimmer of hope that if the civil enforcement mechanism is removed, then what people like Jose are able to do will be all that much more meaningful, right? Because if there's not that threat um, from the activists on the back end with depositions and civil lawsuits to, to be had, then progressive prosecutors and folks who are interested in reproductive justice really can be more protective in a way that, that they're not able to fully protect people now. And so I just wanted to say for, for the one glimmer of hope, I hope that that appeal um, yields the same result that the district court found and you know he he wrote a really long opinion and it was not a, a you know democratic judge it was a, a very well-respected republican judge and um you know i think he has the same feeling that we all did when sb8 was passed that you know there are some things that just run so far afoul of the rule of law and our understanding of how our federal system is supposed to work that that it just shouldn't be um, possible. But thanks to the bravery of, of a bunch of the funds, you know, last September, we're a little bit ahead of where where we uh, otherwise would be at this point. That is great news. And thanks for, I was actually really glad to see that the question was asked and that we have had so much discussion about the civil and criminal um, potential liabilities together. Cause I think we've, Sometimes we've forgotten about it. Some, I shouldn't say, you all have not at all forgotten about SB8, but just with the overwhelmingness of Dobbs. All right, well then I wanna thank you all again for this terrific discussion. And uh, if folks in the audience or participants here in the round table have ideas about future programs we might want to have, discussions we might want to have, um, please let us know. And um, this was, it was a horrible situation to have to have these two panels, but we um, really, I, I can't imagine having gotten together a better group of people to help us think through them. So um, thank you all again and have a good evening. <laughs>